Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Fuel the Pedal podcast, a podcast on the latest research on cycling nutrition for optimal performance and health. And as usual, and I hope it remains as such, I am your host Gabriel Martins, that Portuguese nutritionist guy who just loves finding excuses to talk about cycling and bringing you some of the top world experts on several topics. And today is no exception, we'll be finally tackling a topic that I've been looking forward to have here on the show since episode 1. And hopefully this will be just the beginning of a series of many more episodes dedicated to women's cycling and female physiology, which is the topic we'll be covering today. This is an emerging topic with growing interest among the scientific community, with researchers raising awareness to the fact that most of the research on exercise performance available out there is mostly based on studies performed on males and then extrapolated to females. This goes not only for protein-related research, for example, but also to the ergogenic benefits of some dietary supplements like caffeine. In fact, our research group has just recently published one letter to the editor on nutrients uh, entitled More Research is Needed to Establish the Ergogenic Effect of Caffeine in Female Athletes, underlying the need to bridge this gap on research and alluding to the fact that it's still too early to establish that women experience the same ergogenic response to caffeine as men and further research is needed to describe the optimal conditions of caffeine caffeine use in sports and exercise for women. To cover this and many other topics regarding female physiology and subsequent nutrition strategies for female athletes, particularly cyclists, I'm honored to have here today a very special guest who I take my chances in saying she's probably one of the most experienced researchers slash nutritionists specialized on female physiology and who has dedicated most of her life contributing to most of the science we have available so far on this subject. Our guest today is Dr. Melinda Manor from Oregon. State University. Dr. Melinda Manor is a professor emeritus in nutrition at Oregon State University, where her research focuses on the interaction of nutrition and exercise for obesity prevention, health, and performance. Dr. Manor received her bachelor from Seattle Pacific University, her master's degree from the University of Oregon, and her PhD in nutritional sciences and exercise from Oregon State University. She's a registered dietitian and nutritionist and a certified specialist in sports dietetics. She's authored over 145 scientific publications, four nutrition textbooks, including one on sports nutrition for health and performance, one sports nutrition curriculum, and 160 research presentations at professional meetings. And she's also currently an active member of the American Society of Nutrition, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the Sports and Cardiovascular Nutritionist, and a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. So let's move to our interview with Dr. Melinda Monor on the female cyclist. Nutrition for Optimal Health and Performance, up next on Fuel the Pedal Podcast. Good morning, Melinda. Greetings from this side of the globe. How are things on that side? I am doing very well, and it's a beautiful day here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a joy to have you here on the podcast, and I'd like first to, to thank you for accepting my invitation. Well, it's nice to be here. Great. And where are you talking us from, Melinda? Okay, um, I'm coming from Corvallis, Oregon, which is in the western part of the U.S., and I am at Oregon State University. Which means there's nine hours difference between us, no big deal. You are probably starting your workday, and I've had um, already my, my good share of it. So, Melinda, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your work, and all the research on this topic that you've been uh, performing throughout your career? Yes. So, I am a professor at Oregon State University. My degrees are in nutrition and exercise. My PhD was actually in human nutrition with a minor in exercise science. And I have been doing, on, especially on women, not pr only on women, but especially on women mm -hmm. since I did my dissertation, which was on active and sedentary women and sedentary older women. So I've been doing it for a long time. And when I was working on my degree, just to put this all in perspective, the research on nutrition and exercise was very limited, even in men. So it was really kind of a new field. And I'm also very interested in energy balance and just the role that nutrition and exercise can play in keeping people healthy, whether they're athletes or just recreational um, enthusiasts. 
terrific, Melinda. That means you've been through all the stages of research and that surely gives you a much more complete perspective about the, the current scenario of female physiology and we'll hopefully talk about that during this episode. And I understand you also have a couple of books published on this subject. Could you tell us a little bit about them? Well, I have a textbook called Sport Nutrition for Health and Performance that I published with Human Kinetics. Um, I think the first edition came out maybe in 2000, and we're in the third revision of that book now. And actually, that particular book was my notes, basically, from my class when I was teaching a graduate-level nutrition and exercise class. So I had doctoral students in both nutrition and in exercise in that course. And we never had a textbook. We could, I could never find a textbook. So that's kind of how that book started. And I did it with a um, couple of my colleagues. Actually, one of them was my doctoral student. Now it's in its third revision. And I am, after this revision, I'm stepping down from it, but it's carrying on by um, one of my colleagues and one of my former doctoral students. So I know that it will be a good book. And then I have with also another doctoral student, we have three textbooks on nutrition. One's sort of for non-majors and the other one's for majors. And then we have one for just sort of more the consumer. So, yes, it's kept me busy. And it's not like any of this was planned at all. Just things evolve. Let me put it that way. <laughs> That's great, Melinda. And I'll be sure to provide the links for those books and put them on the show notes for this episode in case guests want to check them out. So onto the topic here at hand today, Melinda. Could you tell us how did you develop an interest to start studying uh, this specific topic of female nutrition and female physiology? Well, it's kind of an interesting story and a roundabout story. I had a skiing accident right after my undergraduate degree. And thinking about going back to college, I'd been teaching high school and I thought, oh, I'll just go back and get a master's and I'll go teach high school. And when I got to the University of Oregon, everybody ran. Everybody ran. And I had this bad knee operated on and I thought, oh, I can't run. And so all the graduate students around me said, it doesn't matter, you can run. And so I started running. And also at the time, just to refresh the memory of the reviewers, the Uni University of Oregon is where Nike started. And so wow. everybody ran, I think, because of Nike. <laughs> and so I started running and then I started running more and then I started doing long distance and then I started doing marathons and I thought, oh, I should know something more about nutrition because I, in, nutrition has always interested me. I had a one undergraduate nutrition course and I started exploring this and I thought, there's nothing on women. The only thing you could find on women is about women might need more iron. And even then, remember, we used to put our, we used to put our, um, liquids in mason jars and go drive out into the country where we're going to run and hide them in the weeds the night before. I mean, we just didn't have all the wonderful things we have now. And it was sort of from that that it all started. And I decided I want to do my degree in nutrition. I really want a nutrition degree. And I need to know more about exercise science because I was, I was with a lot of people who were in exercise science. And I decided I wanted to do my research on nutrition and exercise in women because I couldn't find any information. And so that... So that's kind of how it all evolved, gone from there. And fortunately, I had some great mentors, and those mentors happened to be people who were in exercise science. And they said, we need people who know something about nutrition and exercise science. And so all I can say is I I've been very fortunate in my career. I love what I do. I love teaching students. I love nutrition and exercise. And I wouldn't have accomplished any of that without great mentors and they were the ones that introduced me to the American College of Sports Medicine just took me under their wing and so that's how I actually really really got involved in nutrition and exercise because I had great mentors who were in basically exercise and they said we need people who know nutrition when I finished my PhD and I decided I was going to do academics I started looking for jobs and I especially because of my doctoral research was it was in women it was in young women who were sedentary or active and then it was in older sedentary women I did very involved metabolic feeding studies 
and we were looking actually at vitamin B6, which is very involved in glycogen metabolism, but we fed these women. And what was amazing, one of the most amazing things I learned from that is all the aspects of energy balance and all the exercise testing we did on them. And so when I started looking for a job, I said, well, I want to do nutrition and exercise and I need to be at a university that has both an exercise and a nutrition program. And they told me nobody cares about this area. Nobody cares. We want people who do bench chemistry and really nobody cares about nutrition and exercise. At the same time in my classroom, I have had students asking me all sorts of questions. So it's just funny how the world has changed and how we've come full circle, let's say, what, 25 to 30 years later, where people can say, how could anyone ever say nutrition and exercise weren't connected? But that's not how it was in the beginning. So I'll stop there. (laughs) <laughs> it really is unbelievable how, how the interest for nutrition radically changed over the years, right? We we came from nobody caring about nutrition to suddenly everyone loves it, everyone talks about it, provides misguided advice, and this last one perhaps aggravated by social media. And let's not even go on with that because that will be likely a, a topic for another whole episode, and today is all about women only. So... Melinda, one of the main reasons for us to be here talking about this topic is that not only because uh, female cycling is fortunately on the rise with more and more women participating in the the cycling competitions and we could assume that this tendency will even grow in the next few years and we have some incredible women cyclists out there. Names that might be more familiar to the listeners are Anna van der Breggen, Marianne Vos, Keisha Novadoma, Elisa Longo-Borghini, Corinne Rivera, uh, Anna Mick van Vloten, who is uh, currently the UCI World Race World Champion, and last, but by no means least, I'd like to make a special reference to Britain's Lizzie Dynan, who has been crowned the 2019 Women's World Champion to become the first cyclist to win the event twice, but not only that, she won it nine months after giving birth to her daughter, which I believe it was an incredible, incredible achievement. So women are indeed incredible and uh, capable of some unbelievable feats, but uh, perhaps the science regarding specific nutrition is still a bit uneven, hence the need for this talk. So Melinda, should we start this episode by briefly identifying what are the main physiological and therefore nutritional differences uh, in women's metabolism that may require specific nutrition approaches, particularly in female in endurance athletes so that we can go on over each one of those aspects throughout this episode. Okay. So I'm going to break this into two segments. One is when I interact with the female athlete, what things come to my mind that instantly I want to ask questions about and think about that might be different than a male athlete. And then I'm going to talk about, so what kind of research do we have uh-huh. that have that's been more specific to women? Perfect. Some of the first things that you think about is, one, body composition is different. So I would look at a female athlete and have conversations with them about body composition. We know that women have more body fat than men just in general. So I do know that's different. I also know that women, and maybe this is developing more men, have body image issues. And it might be for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's because their sport demands that they be small or lightweight. Maybe it's just something that came with that individual based on their background, is that they're very self-conscious about their body size or think they should be different. And that's not unique to female athletes. It's just the way it is in the world of women. Mm -hmm. I do know that that's becoming an issue more with men, but it is something that we talk about. I see beautiful women, young women. Even now, we've been doing work in high school girls. we were, we've been working specifically with soccer and to hear them talk about their bodies and how the negative things they say about themselves when I look at them, I see these amazing, wonderful young girls who are beautiful, they're fit, they are smart, they have everything going for them and yet I hear all these negative things. So I'm always very aware of how Those thoughts can impact not only how they perform, how they think about themselves, but then what they choose to eat. So I'm always aware of what are some of the diet issues. And if they are making poor food choices, then I'm starting to think, are they getting enough iron? Because young, because women menstruate. And so we know we lose body iron and iron is poorly absorbed. So are they getting enough iron? Are they getting enough of the B vitamins, which are very important for energy metabolism? And if you don't eat a healthy 
healthy diet, that certainly may be something that is not adequate. We also care about all the bone building nutrients that women should get. And if they're avoiding foods that are high in calcium or if they not if they're doing a sport that's not outside, then I I worry about bone. So those are some of the key nutrients and then with young women and as women mature into their 20s and 30s, I'm all, all we're very concerned about the menstrual cycle because we know that that is important in terms of knowing what's happening metabolically. Are they stressing their body too much? We know it's really important for their bone mineral density. We know they need adequate protein, not only for muscle, but for bone growth. So I want to know where they are in their growth cycle. So those are some of the key things that pop into my mind that I'm going to think about and maybe do some probing questions. Then coming to, okay, so what research do we have in women? And why is it always in men? Well, many of the researchers were men. And so it's just easier not to deal with women. And and that's not anything negative about the men. It's just that women have menstrual cycles. And we now know some of the research really needs to be done at the same time during the menstrual cycle. So any research study you do is going to be really drawn out. It's going to be much longer than maybe if you were doing it in men. The other thing that you have to realize is that if you're doing anything related to metabolism, if you don't do it at the same time in the menstrual cycle and everybody's consistent, then you can't really compare your data to other studies. So you need to do those kinds of things. And then what happens if your women don't menstruate? And if they're athletes, there's a good probability they might not. Then what do you do? You've got women who menstruate, women who don't. Are those women different? And are you going to exclude some women or not? And then the other sort of issue you have to deal with is, do I have an eating disorder? Which is much more prevalent. I mean, it's more prevalent in, in women than men. So those are just some of the issues that any researcher has to deal with. And then you put reality on top of that. Let's pretend that research is being done in an academic setting in a university. Well, universities run on quarters and semesters and students want to finish and everybody wants a study that has this nice beginning and nice end. And if you have to monitor people over a cycle or two or three, the research just isn't, isn't as neat. So I just think there's practical reasons why this hasn't happened and it's just convenience, you know, that who was doing the research. So and recruiting. You know, just then, can you get women to do a study? We finished a study not too long ago where we're following women and refeeding them over um, six months and then tracking them for another six months. So that means we needed each individual to stay with us for at least a year. And we had to stagger start because we couldn't start the women until they were a certain point in their cycle and we'd done all this preliminary work. That means we were tracking the doctoral student was almost tracking women for almost two years. Doctoral students sometimes don't want to stay around that long. They want to get done. And so the, and then you need money and sometimes researcher funding doesn't go that long. So you just have to think about that. So the bottom line is there's been a lot less research done on women than in men. Speaking of cycling specifically, the amount of research that's been done on women in cycling is much less than men. And then if you have elite athletes, many of them don't want to commit the time because you're in, you may be interrupting their training cycle. They may be many places in the world and and I might need blood from you, I might need urine from you. It's just hard to get really elite athletes or maybe the coach. We even had studies where the coach said, I don't want my women participating. And why didn't they want them participating? Because the coach actually knew that he had metabolic issues with these women, that they some people weren't menstruating, some people maybe were getting a lot of stress fractures. And he thought maybe things would change. He just didn't want them engaged with it or he thought it took too much time. So there are many different reasons. And so we have a much smaller body of research. Mm -hmm. For sure. Not only we already have this gap between research in elite versus non-elite athletes that is usually talked about for men, and this gap might even be more evident in women. Uh, do you see a trend of change in the last few years that indicates a possible shift of paradigm for more research to be performed on women? 
Um, I think that there are two areas that are improving. I think we realize that we there is very little research in women, and I think the other is sometimes there's very little ethnic diversity in the research. So you kind of say, well, is it the same for women in every single culture? Well, we have no idea. We just don't have that kind of research. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that's an issue is who's going to pay for the research. Most big companies, unless they're a sport company, or most governments don't want to pay for the research. They want research in sort of the masses. They want research in people who are sedentary and have chronic disease. So it's really hard sometimes to get funding for elite level sports. Some countries are better at funding that, which would be if the government is paying for the funding, it might be much more independent in terms of there's no conflict of interest as opposed to a sport food company or a sport company of some sort paying for that research. So that that's where the researchers also have a dilemma. Do I go to a sport food company and want to do this research and are, are people going to look at that research and say it's biased because look where she got her funding. So it's it's real difficult. And most, many researchers, and I'm one of them, sometimes what we do, and I told you about the research I did for my dissertation where I had sedentary and active and then sedentary older women. Sometimes you do that. You try and get different subgroups that might, you know, represent, well, I want to control that sedentary or maybe my c- control is going to be a more recreational athlete and then elite. But elite athletes are very hard to recruit because of their schedules. Sometimes they don't want to change. So if I tell them I'm going to do a randomized trial and you may or may not be on the treatment, they don't want that because they already have their own routine and they don't want to change anything. Yes. Okay, so now that we have a clearer picture on the state of research and the challenges it still faces, I really wanted to dive straight into the exercise substrate metabolism uh, before getting into more detail on the aspects you've just mentioned. And one thing that listeners may be aware of is that a substrate metabolism may be gender-specific and that female athletes appear to display slightly higher rates of fat oxidation and lower rates of carbohydrate oxidation, as shown by Dr. Mark Tarnopolsky on 2000. And so, Melinda, could you please give Getting into more detail on the substrate metabolism differences on women comparing to men and what would be the practical application to endurance performance in terms of micronutrient recommendation, carb loading protocols, uh, what can you tell us about this? So let me um, answer that in two parts. Yes, there was some early research that said there may be differences in um, fat metabolism between males and females. That was done 20 years ago. We have much more sophisticated techniques in tracer metabolism that we can look at that. And oftentimes those differences, although they may be statistically significant, in terms of practical outcomes, they may not be that big of a difference. Mm -hmm. So I can't really say, yes, you as a female are going to burn a lot more fat than your male counterpart. I just don't think we have the data to support that. And people haven't really followed up with that kind of research because it is very um, labor intensive and it's very individually invasive. I mean, you know, they're they're doing a lot of blood work and they're, they've got to monitor people and it's an expensive research to do. We also know that metabolism is also based somewhat on body composition too. So, you know, whether you have more fat or less fat. And if we're, if we're talking specifically about endurance female athletes, they tend to be very lean. They're still going to be fatter than a male, but they tend to be very lean. So I don't know that... I, if, if I'm making recommendations to a female athlete, I probably wouldn't have them change anything if they're doing what's recommended. I think it's better to focus on what are the recommendations, how, or how are you doing this carbohydrate loading, if that's what you do before race. Not everybody does that. It just depends on how it makes them feel because it can make – You feel heavier and some people don't like that feeling. So I think it's, I put more of an emphasis on what are you doing? What can we do about making dietary changes that might make what you're doing better 
and help you perform better and help you feel better. Because remember, that whole psychological piece is just as important as I think how physically fit you are. The brain plays a big part in how well you do an activity, how well you perform, just how you think you're doing. So I don't, I mean, I know there are metabolic differences in women and and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, especially when we talk about bone and we talk about sports like cycling, which are non-weight bearing and the impact it has on bone, which impacts both men and women, even though we tend to talk about that with just women. Yes. So until we have more data, and I actually had a doctoral student write a paper on this topic. Until we have more data, I don't think we can make very specific dietary recommendations on metabolism because part of it's going to be on how well trained you are. And that's probably more of an overriding factor than some of these other things. Okay, Melinda. So just to clarify the listeners on this one, uh, so the data we have available on substrate metabolism on women is not enough to make specific dietary recommendations for female athletes. And for example, the recommendations for carb loading protocols or even for refueling for multi-stage race, uh, the typical 1.2 grams per kilo per hour wouldn't change as well when compared to men, correct? That's certainly my recommendation, and I just want to give the readers an example of this. I, I've, I've done a lot with energy balance, and oftentimes athletes and non-athletes are saying, should I use this supplement over this supplement because it's a better fat burner? Should I use green mm-hmm. tea and this and that? And it's okay, let's, because this That's research study said there's a significant difference in using this supplement versus no supplement. So I said, okay, let's go look at that. And when you dig down deep into the research and say, so what was that significant difference? Oh, that difference is 20 calories difference. And that was statistically significant. Or if we're looking at weight loss, you took all these supplements and there might be a half a kilo difference. And it happened to come out significant, but we know that a half a kilo could be just how well hydrated or dehydrated you are one day. Of course. So I think you have to dig down to, is it really practically, are you making all these changes and you're putting all of these sort of, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do something else. Does it really matter in the big scope of things? And also, are there other factors that are going to override all of that? Like how fit you are or how fatigued you are that day or if you're recovering from an illness or how stressed you might be. So that's why I think sticking to the basics and trying to do those well will probably pay off than adding a bunch of stress to athletes. And as you know, some athletes are extremely meticulous about what they do and then others are, you know, sort of very haphazard about what they do. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's, I just, I'm careful about not adding more stress and focusing on are you healthy and are the recommendations we're giving you something you feel like you can do? Is it, is it practical for you to do it? Because if, if it's not practical, they're not going to do it anyway. Yes, that's a terrific point, no doubt. I mean, making sure the athlete can apply consistently our recommendations and also making sure these recommendations don't add an extra stress and are feasible in the long term. Uh, which may be the opposite that we have nowadays, I guess, where we we need to study the person that we have in front of us and trying to focus on the basics we can control, which goes for both genders, I guess. Um, so, Melinda, and assuming a, a regular menstrual cycle, how can these normal fluctuations in oestrogen and progesterone influence the nutritional requirements during the different phases of the menstrual cycle? Um, should we expect to see some conditioning of um, a female endurance performance in training or in competition in terms of uh, training tolerance or fatigue resistance? Okay, so before we talk about the menstrual cycle, just following up on your last comment, in terms of dietary recommendations and making suggestions, when you're dealing with any athlete, because I think it's true of male athletes to some degree as well, I want to make sure that I am not pushing this person toward any sort of disordered eating, thinking, oh, I got to follow all these rules. And I don't want to be the one that's doing that. So that's, and you're walking a fine line there. 
especially if if you're in a sport like endurance exercise cycling where you need a lean build the other thing the other reason i don't want to push that way is i know that if for some reason they're getting really controlling about food and maybe they're controlling about their energy too because they want to keep their weight at a competitive weight, it can impact their menstrual cycle. And it's not uncommon for female athletes to move in and out of a normal menstrual cycle over the training year. So when they're training really hard, they may stop menstruating. And then when they're in the off season and they're not training as much, maybe their period comes back. So we know that having a period and not having a period impacts their health. Their reproductive health is probably somewhat of a snapshot of just how stressed they are, maybe what their cortisol levels are if they're not menstruating. Also, it means that they may or may not be able to get pregnant in I can expand on that in a minute. If they don't menstruate for years on end, which many female athletes never even really start a normal menstrual cycle and they may be into their 20s, we know that that very negatively impacts their bone health. And you can't you can't play catch up when you've gone too far down the road. So they may go into adulthood with a much lower bone mineral density than they would have or should have had they had a normal menstrual cycle. In general, active women have higher bone mineral density than their sedentary counterparts. Part of that is is because of their weight-bearing exercise. If you start young, let's say, into cycling, and cycling is non-weight-bearing, it's the same issue that you get with swimmers, then you don't have that that weight-bearing stress on the bones to build more bone. So if you have a cyclist, they're spending hours on the bike. If they don't have some weight-bearing physical activity in their lives, they may not be getting the level of bone. And we actually have seen this in male cyclists and in female cyclists that their bone mineral density is lower than even their endurance, let's say, runner who's a counterpart to them. So knowing about the menstrual cycle is important knowing whether they move in and out of that cycle because there's now some data in endurance case studies and endurance athletes where they've moved in and out of a cycle, but always made sure that when they were out of their intense training period, they were eating well, their cycle came back, bone mineral density could be maintained. But that wasn't a runner. So we're not, sometimes we know that people, and also usually in the non-training, I mean the non-competitive season, they may gain a little weight. We do the same thing with wrestlers. Wrestlers are terrible about losing weight. Well, you can't stay at those super low weight. I mean, it's just, there's no body fat on them, wrestlers, those lean wrestlers. So you really say to them, you've got to gain some weight to be healthy again. And so the cyclists may have to go through that. They may have to be willing to gain a little bit of weight. And we've done these studies in women, and we have to tell them right up front, you're not having a period. We're going to refeed you extra calories and see when your period comes back and when you get normal ovulation. But the outcome may be you're going to gain weight. Well, how do you think they respond to that? Terribly. Yes. And so oftentimes they'll say, well, I can't be in your study. At, at the same time, the, the one thing I didn't mention, and I just want to sort of add this here, in trying to do these studies, they are very hard because we're dealing with all these issues, weight issues, eating disorder issues, performance issues, because they don't want to change anything because of performance, is we have an ethical issue with our institutional review boards when we come to them and say, well, we want to do these kinds of studies, and if, and, the, and if you try to publish stuff, they'll say, well, you didn't, have a, you didn't have a control group that didn't have their period, and you just kept them for six months with no period and measured their bone before and after. Your review board will say that's unethical because we know that that's probably not very good for that woman. And so I, I, can, I can say, look, I can't, I don't, our review board would not let us have a control group where we didn't intervene if we knew there was a problem. At the same time, sometimes those women don't want you to intervene and they won't join your study. So there's just so many issues and and for me as a researcher and as a dietitian, I sit with the women and say, look, you may gain a few pounds, but it actually may help performance. You may feel stronger. That doesn't mean you're going to gain fat. 
it means that maybe you're going to get enough calories to maintain your muscle. Exactly. And I'm really glad you brought that up. And it can be so difficult to pass that message, right? That increasing weight and getting into an ideal body composition can actually increase your performance, not impair it. And I, I didn't include specific questions about eating disorders and uh, red ass and because I knew these topics would come up eventually. So yeah, I, I totally agree that we, we should look up for these kind of behaviors when dealing with athletes, both male and female alike, uh, for whom the weight is a constant concern on one side. But on the other side, it can also be, uh, it can also have a decisive role in cycling performance. Uh, we know for sure that a high power to weight ratio is an important factor uh, for cyclists to be able to climb more efficiently and to accelerate quickly as well. But when this becomes an obsessive quest for the cyclist, this could be a problem. And for that reason, I think it's inevitable to talk about the female athlete triad, which links low energy availability with uh, menstrual dysfunction and impaired bone health. So uh, despite the high energy needs that cycling, training and competition demands, many female athletes appear to restrict energy intake to lose body fat, uh, to improve performance or to achieve a desired body size, according to some of your research. So Melinda, my question would really be, uh, in your experience, what leads to this uh, low energy availability? How prevalent is it in female athletes and what can be the main consequences for female endurance athletes? All right, so let me just back up and talk a little bit about what do you mean by low energy availability? And I was on the position paper where we did the first, I was on the second, excuse me, position paper on the female athlete triad. It was published in 2007 in Medicine, Science, and Sport and Exercise um, where this term was introduced. Now, you have to realize initially the data were actually done in sedentary women in a, in a clinical setting. And that number came out to be that when you get fewer than 30 calories per kilogram fat-free mass, you don't have enough energy to support menses. Then we extrapolated women who exercise. And basically, the way that calculation was done is we look at all the energy you take in, and then we subtract from that the energy expended just in exercise. And that in itself is very difficult to define in the real world in an athlete. And I'll explain that in a minute. So we subtract your exercise energy expenditure from the calories that you're consuming. And it says there's this remainder. What's left over? Is that enough to maintain just good health and reproductive function? And if you are a youth, enough to grow on? If it's not, then what you're considered to be in low energy availability. And that's been expanded now. Female athlete has been expanded and looked at. And now we have um, what we call red S. And basically, we realize that this can be true in any athlete, male or female, where you're not getting enough calories to maintain all those metabolic functions that are required for good health, which means, you know, protein synthesis, it means your whole immune response, it means your bone, your brain, your blood nutrient. I mean, you're just not getting enough in for good health. So we know in women, when energy availability is low, basically people are restricting their calories or maybe limiting food groups because sometimes people do that. They'll just say, well, I'm not eating that food group and I'm not eating that food group. And as a nutritionist, when I see people start to do that, I say, well, that's fine. You don't eat meat, you don't eat dairy, and you don't eat this, and you don't eat that. Where are you getting the nutrients that you need that we happen to get in those foods? Are you getting them other places? So that's always a concern. But what happens is the body says, in essence, think of it as starting to go into starvation. The body says, whoa, you're exercising, and yet I'm still trying to keep you healthy, and I'm still trying to make sure you have reproductive function. I'm still trying to repair damaged bone. I'm still trying to repair. Um, damaged muscle and you're just not eating enough so I'm going to have to start cutting back on something and so what we'll see is we'll see metabolic rate go down we'll see menses start to go away because all that requires energy and in ba and basically in third world countries when pe when there's famine there's no menses and women can't get pregnant because they really don't have enough energy to support a pregnancy in a situation where there's no food and it's probably and it's probably not good for the mother or the infant we know it's not good for them 
So that's kind of what's happening here is you're kind of doing a little bit of a starvation to the body and it says, okay, I got to start making some decisions and I'm going to get rid of a few things I can't maintain anymore and I'm going to reduce your metabolic rate or I'm going to stop menses. And then that, because estrogen plays an important role in calcium metabolism and in maintaining the bone, then you just, you actually, what happens is you start breaking more, down more bone than your building bone. And so women, young women, college age women can have the bone de- mineral density of an older woman, maybe 50 to 70 years old. And they'll start getting stress fractures or actual fractures. And we know it's just not healthy for them. So then it's talking to those women and and saying, look, you need to eat more calories. And it's not that they have an eating disorder. I mean, I want to emphasize that because in the beginning, let's say I would talk to a group of female athletes in a college setting. They didn't want to tell me that they weren't menstruating because they felt like if they weren't menstruating, then the coach would find out and then maybe the coach wouldn't let them participate or the, the physician wouldn't let them participate. At the same time, oftentimes some coaches would be happy when women stopped menstruating, saying, okay, now you're finally training enough. And it was almost a marker of getting adequate training, when in essence it was a marker that their bodies were being stressed too much, not enough calories, and high demands for physical activity. Now, let me just stop and go back. Let me just give you an example of some of the women in some of our studies. These women wanted to menstruate. They were willing to eat more food. We gave them more food. And sometimes, in in essence, for us, it was around 300 to 400 extra calories a day that these women needed. When the study was over and we wanted to track these women, they just said, you know, I don't feel like eating that much food. It just isn't, you know, I just, my appetite, exercise can impact appetite. And people are just different. And so they said, you know what, to pack that half extra half a sandwich or to remember to do, it's just, I just don't want to, I just, I find it hard to do. And they would just kind of slide right back to no menses. On the flip side, we had an athlete come into our study. And, you know, sometimes you ask lots and lots and lots of questions and you don't always get complete answers. And... We started refeeding her and her and her period, her menses came back and we were checking ovulation. And we tell people, remember, you can ovulate before your period can start. So you can get pregnant and still think you are not having a cycle and think that you're home free. Well, she calls us up and she says, well, she didn't call. She comes over and she says, I need to talk to you. I'm pregnant. And it's like, oh, great. Because that's a risk factor when you do these studies is that these women haven't been menstruating. And I say, look, you're going to get a period and remember, you could get pregnant and you need to use an alternative form of birth control. Well, for us, fortunately, she wanted to get pregnant and that's why she entered the study. She just didn't tell us that. And she'd been going to all these reproductive doctors saying, I I can't get pregnant. She joined our study. We fed her more. She could continue to exercise and she had a healthy baby. So there's many sides to this issue and trying to convince women that this is helping keep your body healthy. And then some women are just more prone to not menstruating when they bump up their training. And I cannot explain that. They bump up their training and they stop. The next person bumps up their training. They're fine. They're both lean. They both have low body fats. I mean, I can't explain why they're different. (laughs) Yes, and there still seems to be out there this assumption that female athletes need to lose their menses and it's something that it's supposed to happen. I still have one statement recorded on my mind said by a known cycling coach here in Spain in a congress and he said if she has a menstrual cycle, then she's not an athlete. This words impacted on me so much back then and it still got me wondering how many cycling coaches and coaches of other endurance sports are out there that have this same idea and same assumption. Do you believe that this preconceived idea is still on coaches' minds? Um, Yes, it's certainly out there. And I've heard it too. And I've heard the athletes come and tell me this. I think one of the biggest things we have to do is educate coaches and we have to pound it into their heads the importance of taking care of their athletes and being healthy because I something t- sometimes think all they think about is the outcome and the performance and they don't think about health. I also think it's starting to change compared to let's say 
15, 20 years ago. I think it's starting to change because I think we're getting a little bit better educated coaches. But I can tell you there are still these pockets of coaches out there that think that way. And sometimes they're not just male coaches. They're female coaches. So, um, yes. you know, so I, I get really frustrated with that because when I give dietary recommendations, one of the things I will tell the athlete, I do care about your performance, but I also care about your health. And I can't make recommendations recommendations that I think are not healthy. And I'll tell you that. And you can, and especially if you're an adult, you can make the decision. And I can give an example of a um, professional wrestler who was going into the Olympics. He came and wanted to be weighed and get his body fat. And it was at the time when um, underwater weighing was still being done much more frequently. It's not being done very much anymore. We underwater weighed him and and, you know, there's a certain error with every body composition method. We underwater weighed him at 3% body fat. And I know the error for that method is going to be 2 to 3%. He, he looked, he was a walking skeleton. And yet he's going to the Olympics to compete as a wrestler. So what do I tell him? I, ethically, I am a dietitian. I mean, I have to tell him. I, and I said, you are so underweight and you have gotten so lean and he was going to lose more weight before the Olympics. I said, I have to tell you, it's not healthy. You're an adult. You can do what you want. If you're going to still lose weight and go and compete, you are losing cardiac tissue when you get that low. You're losing organ tissue. I mean, we got data to support that. That's what happens with eating disorders. But you need to gain the weight back. And I think that's why we have to, when we stress the body so much, they get it gets lean. And then the body's saying, whoa, I'm lean. And yet you're making me exercise so much that I have to shut down something. And yet we had one of our, um, this was a distance runner who when we talked to her, we said, you've got to eat more. you got to refeed. She was young. She was 18. She was, just, she was in between high school and college. And she got recruited to a junior college. And she did what we said. And she kept emailing us back. I'm doing, my performance is so much better. I am breaking my personal records. I'm breaking records. And I actually got recruited to a higher level university because I'm doing so well in my sport. Hmm. That's when I see really positive outcomes where they take it to heart and say, look, I can be a better athlete if I actually feed myself better. That's just amazing to know there are such good examples of female athletes who, you know, contrarily to popular belief, improve their performance after putting some weight back and not the other way around. There are coaches and nutritionists who are doing indeed their job well, but there's still much work to do. And hopefully this podcast can give a positive contribution to raise awareness for this. And uh, to be able to start changing this, we need to be aware and know what patterns uh, we may need to pay attention in order to identify this and act quickly. Um, are there any obvious patterns in your opinion that we should look out for as nutritionists? Uh, avoiding particular food groups and carbs are generally the first target to cut and in the current plant-based era that we're living, athletes may consider also uh, cutting animal protein as well. But what additional behavioral changes or patterns would you say are the ones we as nutritionists and coaches need to pay more attention to? Okay, so I'll t touch on the one you just touched on. I, you, in my academic research career, I've seen macronutrients come in and out of popularity. I think the <laughs> data is extremely strong that endurance athletes need carbohydrate and they're very good metabolizers of carbohydrate. And of course, as a nutritionist, I want them to get healthy carbs. So, but there's still a very specific place for, you know, more concentrated, simpler carbohydrates when you're actually competing and training. It's not that you don't need protein and it's not that you don't need fat. And so, you know, this all or none mentality we seem to get in. I need protein. Sure. Of course, the keto diets are still very popular. And I've seen them come in and out of popularity like three or four times in my academic career. Like a white so, mentality. I know. So we still need those carbohydrates and we still need protein. And we still need healthy fats. So we can't just like eliminate them. And, you know, there was a period of time 
when female athletes especially, their goal was zero fat. And when you, if you cut out all meat, you cut out all dairy, you cut out everything that had fat in, you oftentimes lost a lot of protein and then you were just left with carbohydrate. And we realized that that was not a good thing either. So we, we need to balance. At the same time, you can't metabolize any of those macronutrients without the proper micronutrients. And somehow that seems to get lost on people, mm-hmm. that you need those foods that you eat to be very nutrient dense, which means you need to eat less processed foods and eat more whole foods and you need to eat whole grains. You need to eat fruits and vegetables. You can't just get all your calories out of one energy bar and a sport drink because that's the other thing we start to see when you say, well, these are things that you can use to use as snacks and you can you can use them in training, especially if you can't eat much food and your stomach's upset. But what we found out is they started making a meal out of them. That was my meal. And it's like, what? That's what you're eating? Well, what happens is when you eat very processed foods, it tells you exactly what the calories are. And so you know exactly what you ate. And they get very obsessed about it. So I think we need, especially women, we need the B vitamins and we need folate and B12, which remember B12 is found only in animal products. So if you're not using animal products, where are you going to get that? You need the B vitamins to metabolize all that carbohydrate. And the studies that I've seen where athletes don't get this is when they eat very processed diet that don't have those things added. And male athletes actually are a group that are really can do that because they can get so many calories. They can drink a lot of pop and they can eat a lot of sweets that don't have very many um, nutrients in them. The other things that women need, they need absorbable iron. And we now know that iron is much bigger than just making sure you have oxygen delivered and you have hemoglobin. We know that it's very important at the mitochondrial level for electron transport and for you to get appropriate energy produced. So you have to make sure that you have adequate iron. And what you shouldn't do, and this is another thing that drives me crazy, is where the coach says, okay, I want all my women on iron supplements, or I want all my athletes on this supplement, or even situations where it's very unethical is the coach says, you have to take this supplement. Oh, and by the way, I happen to be selling that supplement. Yes. That is like so unethical. And then the other is the calcium building nutrients that you want to make sure that you get. And so there's so much about nutrition we don't know yet. And I don't think athletes should make the assumption that they can get everything they need in a supplement. There are phytonutrients, there are compounds, there are synergism between the vitamins or minerals and these other compounds in foods that we don't even know about. You We're still learning about and keeping your gut healthy and the um, microbiome healthy. So eating real foods is important. And just assuming you can get everything out of a sport food that's been engineered or a supplement in a bottle isn't isn't healthy. It's just not the way that nutritionists that work in this area recommend. And if you do need special micronutrients or you have special health problems, then we need to know what those are and we need to have some blood levels to make appropriate recommendations. People will come to me and say, well, I'm tired. I think I need an iron supplement. It's like, I'm sorry, but I can't make a recommendation based on that information. I need more data to make a good recommendation. So I think, and women, the other thing that's unique about women compared to men, because in general, they're smaller. So even if you have to a male and a female who are equally as trained and competitive, probably will have the female being smaller and they just need less calories because they don't get to eat as much. They have to make sure that the calories they do eat have the appropriate nutrients in them. They just have to be more careful. And I know it's not fair, but that is just the way it is. And so they just have to make better decisions. And it's not that they can't have foods they really like or things they think are treats because I'm really not not somebody who says you should never have this and never have that because I've learned over the years you got to do you got to work with where people are and what seems feasible to them and if having treats once in a while is really important then Mm -hmm. they probably need to do that yeah Yeah, there's not a prescription that everybody has to follow because you got to build it within what works for them true that balance is definitely needed nowadays 
Uh, jumping now into protein requirements for female athletes, we've briefly grasped this topic with Dr. Daniel Moore here on the podcast before. Based on the current knowledge, would you say that female athletes have different protein requirements when compared to their male counterparts? I would probably say not based on a gram per kilogram recommendation. Hmm. And for two reasons, we have much less data in female athletes. Also, if you even look at where the, in the U.S., the dietary recommendations came from, you know, those recommendations came from sedentary individuals. And also, when you dig deeper, oftentimes it's, it's sedentary males. But I think we, the data we do have in women that they do need at least, I mean, my goal would be at least 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight. So, and that's very similar. And remember also, depending on what other foods they're eating, some of that protein may get used as an energy source. We know that that happens. So we really do want to maintain their lean tissue and we need enough not only to maintain it, but but, you know, do the building and repair. That's why carbohydrates so important because it really does help spare protein to do what protein does. I think in the women who that I have seen over my career who tend not to get enough protein are the women who are restricting their caloric intake. They're trying to cut back, and I'm sorry, you can only cut back so much before you just can't get enough of everything. And then if you go to, oh, I'm just going to eat protein, then where do you get your carbohydrate? And also carbohydrate fuels the brain too, you know, we can't forget that. And I think that can affect mood and how you feel about doing physical activity. And again, I've seen people just respond so differently that when they don't get enough carbohydrate, they have real mood swings. They're angry. They don't train well. It just doesn't work. They don't get along with their teammates. (laughs) Nothing seems to work. (laughs) So I think you just, you know, people are different and you just have to help those people figure out what works for them, knowing that everybody's got a little bit of a nuance. And so as a dietitian, it's something I try to teach my students, listen to the athlete. Listen to people. Don't make the assumption that you that they don't know what they're talking about because it's their body. And athletes are oftentimes extremely in tune to their body. And what they want is you to give them permission. Yes, you can do that. Yes, you can do that. No, you don't have to do what everybody else is doing. They just want someone to give them permission because they're so afraid of not doing what everybody else is doing because boy if they're doing it we must have to do this the same thing too if we're going to win yes and we tend to forget about that normally when we talk about athletes uh, we talk about them as if they were these divine entities but we are actually talking about people Yes. who want to be heard, people who have issues, uh, people who seek our approval, as you mentioned, and we must be sensitive to these kind of things. It's something that nutrition degrees can teach us and only experience, I think, with athletes uh, can teach us with time. Uh, moving on to a more controversial topic, Melinda, uh, considering vegan female athletes, or as today's marketing label is set, plant-based athletes, and let's not get into detail on the Game Changers documentary, I think we can both agree that if well planned, a vegan slash plant based diet can support performance as equally as an omnivore diet. But I really wanted to get your opinion on this, Melinda. Uh, taking into consideration all the increased risks, behaviors, and nutritional issues that, that we've been discussing here so far, do you believe that vegan athletes can be equally successful and achieve all macro and micronutrient requirements without compromising health and performance? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think we have a lot of data to support that. And we have a lot of athletes around the world that their diets are primarily vegan Mm -hmm. and who perform very well. But the one thing, especially like in a developed country where maybe that's not the eating norm for the population, if you're going to do the vegan diet, and remember in female athletes, I see this start at a very young age when kids are in junior high or high school where they know nothing about eating well on a vegan diet is that they need someone to help guide them. They need to know, okay, if I'm not going to eat animal products, 
where do I get my protein? Soy is an extremely good source of protein, and they can combine protein. So I think this is where they may need some guidance, and that's where the dietitian comes in. And one of the first things I ask, because a lot of times I see the start in very young females, the first question I ask is, so why do you want to do a vegan diet? And if they give me what I think might be a more appropriate answer is, you know, I really do think it might be healthier diet or I really want to limit the impact on the environment, then I'm okay with that. But what I have seen is that sometimes they use that as an excuse to really do more disordered eating. And what can a parent do? If my child says, I don't want to eat animals anymore. Well, the parent says, oh, dear. Okay, well, and they don't realize it's masking something else. So I always try, and not only just in these situations, but every time an athlete comes to me and says, I want to try this or I want to do this, I always try first before I say anything is why do you want to do it? Get to the bottom of it and then work from there with them and say, okay, well then if that's what you really want to do, let's do some research and let's figure out what might work for you. And are you preparing your own food? Do you know how to shop and do, you know, because I have to tell you, there's a lot of athletes, they've never cooked in their life. And if you're going to go on one of these diets, then how are you going to get what you need? What's your process? Help help me walk through this so that I can know where I can help you. But also I think it helps them realize, oh, maybe I do need some help. Maybe I need to learn a few things before I can do this well. Yeah, And that's when the family perhaps plays a, an important complementary role, right? Yes. And, and families, whether you're, if you're still living at home with mom and dad and you're a young athlete, you can get the family just throwing up their hands and saying, well, okay, I'm just going to let my kid eat bread and toast or whatever, instead of really saying, well, they're not getting everything. What are we going to do? And how are we going to get training? Or the parent can put up roadblocks and really try to thwart the effort. And then it just causes a lot of conflict instead of saying, well, how can we maybe do this better? And we can do some vegetarian meals as a family and the child can learn how to cook. If they're, let's say a college student, I'm going, so how are you going to go about doing this? Are you going to cook? Are you, you know, are you, do you live in a co-op? Do you, are you going to go and buy your food? How are you going to do it? Because I've seen students, I mean, young athletes, they're living in an apartment. And I said, so do you cook? And they, no, I don't cook. Well, how are you going to eat? Well, I get snack food. It's like, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't really going to work. <laughs> So it's just getting the whole scenario and figuring out, okay, what kinds of foods do you like? How can I find my protein? How much do I need throughout the day? And what does that mean in foods? You can't talk to athletes in grams per kilogram. You have to talk about real food. And this kind and will this work in and now let's try some things and will this work? And the one thing I've learned to say is which of these things do you think you can do? And if they don't think they can do any of them, it ain't going to happen. I think it is a process. And I've tried, I've learned myself, and I've tried to teach people, we as nutritionists just can't come in and dictate. You need to do this and this and this and this. You have to work with the individual and troubleshoot with them together. So they come up with something that they say, yeah, I think... I think I'd like to try this, and I think it would work for me. And then they've bought into it, and I, you're, you're probably going to have more success. At the same time, I'm always thinking in the back of my head, don't make things too regimented so that you might push someone who could go into a disordered eating behavior. Don't let them go down that road. You know, Give them enough flexibility where they don't have to get too rigid if that's their personality yes. or they've had an eating disorder in the past. Yes, that's an excellent message to conclude this point. I would only add something, if you agree with me, uh, that it is much easier nowadays perhaps to be vegan 
athlete or not than it was 10 years ago. If there's anything positive about all the diet trends that come and go, it's a legacy of varied foods that we have now available for us to use in different diet regimens and different preferences. I would only ask one additional thing regarding vegan slash plant-based diets, Melinda, because I believe this is really important. Do you believe that young female athletes, let's say around 8 or to 12 years old or even younger who are getting into sport can equally engage into a vegan diet that can support performance and adequate growth and development at the same time? That's a good question and I'm going to answer it in two parts. The answer, the first answer would be yes if she has a family that's vegan or vegetarian and know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that person can do it on their own Mm -hmm. and I think they and they can't do it with just a family who thinks they know what a vegan diet is. I mean, I've seen kids sent to school on a vegan diet and all they had was popcorn to eat. Yes. And they're, they're so, their growth is so um, stunted that, it, I mean, it's malnutrition. So in general, if I'm talking about the average family in the U.S., I would say no because families are too busy. Families are just rushing around, just trying to get through the day. And I think they need convenient, really nutrient-dense, healthy foods. So I think that some real thought has to be put into it. If they're going to go totally vegan, I think they really can move toward that. And they can have some healthier options. But I know that time and convenience are important as well. So my recommendation is if a family is vegan and they're really good at it, and I, I know some very good vegan families who know what they're doing, I think their kids are going to be fine. But for the average family I know, I would be very careful. And that's why when I see those young girls and the mother comes to me and says, my daughter wants to be vegetarian, I really dig a little bit deeper into what's going on and try to really say, look, there are certain things that a glass of milk is very convenient way or a glass of soy milk that's supplemented with calcium is an easy way to get protein and calcium in the diet. And you just have to go with some of those things. And a part of it also is what those things might cost because if you buy, let's say, soy milk, it may cost you more money. At the same time, it's like almond milk, really? No, that's not going to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so... I think for just convenience sake, making sure they get some high quality protein is important. Terrific. And just before wrapping things up here, Melinda, would you say that from all the ergogenic aids uh, with more evidence available for their use, for example, caffeine, creatine, sodium bicarbonate, beta alanine, nitrates, um, would any of these be of particular interest for female athletes? To my knowledge, there's very little data on females to say there's a difference and personally I would say no I mean something like caffeine we do know people have different sensitivities to it so that's something regardless of your male or female you need to know that and you need to know what level works for you mm -hmm. because I've seen people who can use no caffeine it just doesn't compute for them so but the others uh, and I don't know enough about every single one in absolute detail to say, okay, I think the women might respond differently. I think most of those supplements, you know, people have to try them out for themselves. And they you don't do it in a race. You know, you try it out. You try it in training. You see if it works. And um, creatine is a great example where some people think, oh, it helps. Some people it doesn't. Some people don't like their, the way they feel. It, that's such an individual thing. I think most people realize caffeine can really have a place in sport. And so then they just have to decide how habituated they are to it and what works for them. Terrific, Melinda. And what final messages would you like to leave our listeners with regarding everything that we've been talking about so far? I'd say for the, for the researchers, many of them don't have a lot of experience recommending giving dietary advice to athletes in the sense of how does that translate into real foods because that may not be what they do. So I would say if that's not what you do, if you're doing more than metabolism in the lab, then get a dietitian or somebody to help you make that translation for the athlete into real food because that people eat real food. 
And supplements for, as the nutritionist, supplements are always secondary. Food first, secondary. If if the next thing I could recommend is think about eating whole grains, fruits and vegetables. Think about whether you're getting the omega-3 fatty acids in your diet because we do know that they have a significant role in you know, reducing inflammation and in many other health benefits. Thinking if you can afford it, I mean, I really try to eat close to the earth. You know, I try to get things that are more organic. I try to eat locally. I try to eat uh, more whole grains. All of those things, um, I think, can be healthy for you. And I eat less and less processed foods. At the same time, people should enjoy food and not be obsessed with it. Especially that last bit is particularly important, no doubt. Melinda, this has been really interesting and we've been discussing a topic that needs much more attention, but hopefully our message here was quite clear and strong so that not only researchers can help to bridge this gap in female athletes' lack of research, but also to translate that theory and data into practice, as you've mentioned. With this, Melinda, I would finish our episode today, taking this chance to thank you once again for your time. Oh, thank you. And thank you for having me. And if there's anything else you need, let me know. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Melinda. Sure. Bye. And that was it for today's episode on female athletes that can apply not only to cyclists, but to other endurance sports as well. I believe some important points were made regarding the aspects we need to pay more attention to regarding female athletes' health and performance. One of the things that I believe is particularly important to take as a take-home message is the fact that female athletes are not supposed to lose their menses and this idea needs to disappear. We have amazing examples of incredible women who maintain a healthy reproductive function while competing at a very high elite level and that is the proof that it is possible to do things right with proper planning and knowledge. I hope you all enjoyed this episode and catch you later on the next one. Stay cool!